I like how I'm like, eh, it totally sucks. But eh, what can else can you do? So today we're going to deal with the abiotic factors. We're not looking at, we're not going to look at community dynamics. So it's actually relatively straightforward, which is kind of nice. We have a whole bunch of objectives that's going to show up on the first test. So let's talk ecology. The term ecology quite literally means the study of home. Because ecos is a location or a dwelling, logos, study of or knowledge of. So ecology, study of home. Home is wherever life exists. So we can look at life in a whole bunch of different tiers and all of that qualifies under ecology. But ecology requires you to look at life and the location. It's not just looking at cells or how the cells behave. It's life and the environment at the exact same time. There's a whole bunch of different views that we can take of ecology. The biggest of those is what we call global or biosphere ecology. That's when we're looking at everything collectively. So when we start worrying about climate change, that's usually where people's minds jump to. We can start looking at landscape ecology, which is looking at how ecosystems cluster together and patterns that we see distributed across the earth. We can look at ecosystems themselves and what things seem to contribute to ecosystems and what we can start to see of, oh, ecosystems in these types of environments all seem to behave the same way. Within those ecosystems, we can start looking at communities. So how are those populations within these areas behaving with each other? And then within all those different groups, we can look at one type of pop or one type of organism at a time and how their numbers are changing and how they interact with each other. The bottom rung of this organis organismal ecology is actually behavior. This is the one thing that we're going to skip. And the main reason is, well, time is one reason. Second one is I don't know tons about it and I don't want to completely and totally embarrass myself. If you've ever taken a psychology course, almost guaranteed you've dealt with some of this stuff, like learned behaviors versus trained behaviors and what have you, innate functioning, whatever. So, oops, I still had this stuff up here. So for us to tell the story of life on Earth and us having ecology, we need to place Earth and figure out what's going on with Earth. So to do this, what we need to have is figure out how we have different environments on Earth. Well, the way that we have these different environments are going to be due to a whole bunch of different factors. It's not just one cause. But one big driver that we're going to turn out to have as to what's going on with these different environments is the fact that seasons affect environments differently. So we have these environments, these spots, but if we trace them throughout the year, they will change differently. Some will change more, some change less. Some of them are predictable, some of them are not as predictable how they'll change. But it then begs the question of, well, where do these seasons come from? The simplest, most straightforward answer is the Earth is knocked off its axis. We are at a tilt. This we have known about for centuries, if not millennia. People who, I don't know if any of you know any flat earthers. I don't happen to know any. I, there's a few mosquitoes in here. Just letting you all know there's some mosquitoes in the room because thanks. They're not seeming to want humans because all they do is they kind of hover in front of your face and then be like, oh, you're not what I bite. And they fly away and they're like, hey, and they come back to you again. Like, oh, you're not what I want to bite. So if you have something coming near you, it is a mosquito. 
just swat at it. It's not going to bite you because <laughs> we're not its target. We've known about seasons for an obscenely long amount of time. And one of the easiest ways that we could figure out, or we've known about seasons, we've known that the Earth is, a, is on a tilt. One of the ways that we can explain the fact that the Earth is on a tilt, which is not explaining how we know it's not a flat Earth. There's several ways you could explain why the Earth is not flat. But what we could do is we would notice over time, over the course of a year, if you had nothing better to do but trace how high the sun goes up in the day, what you would notice over time, depending on where you were, the sun would go up this far and then back down. Then it'd go up this far, then back down. Then it'd go up this far, then back down. Then this far, then back down. And then just kind of repeat. There was a predictable pattern as to how high up the sun would go in the sky and then when it would retreat back down. How high it would go and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We started to give names to these things. We know that if the sun is up in the sky longer, we get more daylight. And we know that if it's not up there in the sky as long, we get less daylight. We're almost there. Say, we'll get there. So, we have these patterns of how high it goes. And it seems to be repeatable as to how high it goes and how low it will go. Year after year after year. We have these ability to predict these. So we mark the highest point that it ever reaches and mark that day. And then we also mark the day when it's at its lowest that it ever reaches. The day when it's at its highest, we deem to be a solstice. Similarly, the day when it's at its lowest, we also deem to be a solstice. The one that happens in what we now call June is when the sun is at its max. It's the highest it ever reaches during the entire year. About what day is that in June? Somewhere plus or minus a day, roughly, of the 21st. Every once in a while, it'll land on the 18th. Every once in a while, it'll land on the 23rd. But for the most part, it's somewhere around 20th, 21st, 22nd of June. We mark this day by saying it has the most sunlight Meaning, in a 24-hour period, where we are, we will have more sunlight than at any other point in the entire year. We also use this day to mark something. We call it summer. It's also sometimes referred to as the summer solstice. Summer officially begins somewhere around June 21st. Go to the exact opposite, half a year later, which is six months, will be at the lowest, meaning the sun does not reach, it's the lowest height it ever reaches. When it highest, so if you track it during the day, it's the lowest it ever reaches for its high point. This, of course, is also going to be somewhere around the 21st. And we say that this day has the least sunlight. Or it's the, quote, shortest day. Because we count day by how much light there is, not by how much night there is. We give this one also a name. We call this June solstice the summer solstice. This one here in December must also be the winter solstice. So indeed, we break for summer vacation before it's summer. We will break for winter vacation before it's winter. Nice. If I were to cut these in between, so most sunlight, least amount of sunlight. At some point, we have to have like an in-between point. Somewhere halfway in between these six months. So about 
three months later, we will have a point at which we will have equal daylight and equal night. So light and night are equal. We have about 12 hours of each. We name this point the equal night. How do you say equal night in Latin? Equinox. It's when day and night are equal to each other. This one here is in March, obviously around the 21st. We mark this one as what? The spring equinox. You have started the spring semester during the winter time. Nice. We then, six months later, have another point in the shuffle where we will have equal light and night. So we have another equinox. This one here we call the fall equinox somewhere around September 21st. So congratulations, you start the small, or the small, the fall semester in the summer. All of our names are a little bit off. You'd think that we could fix this, but no, no, we can't. It's actually kind of strange because we associate summer as being really long. So, oh yeah, the days are always long in the summer. That's not true. The days only get shorter in the summertime because we're going from the peak down. We associate wintertime as, oh, that's when it's all the days are really short, except all they do is get longer in the winter. We view all of this stuff the wrong way. We're kind of screwed up. That's fun. What day is the longest day of the year? So if you look at what I have up there, what must the answer be? It has to be the summer solstice, of course. There's two M's. I can't spell. Here becomes the catch with this tilt thing. Because the Earth turns out to be a sphere, or we're not really a sphere, but we're kind of close-ish to a sphere, we're actually bottom heavy. We're actually more like a pear than we are a sphere. I don't know if you knew that. We're not really a sphere. Top is a little too small and the bottom is a little too big. But anyway, ignoring that little bit. If I look at the top when it's summertime, if I were to look at the top when it's wintertime, the difference seems to be whether we in the Northern Hemisphere are aimed at the sun. If I look here at the top, we're aimed at the sun during summertime. Tell me about the southern half of the Earth. They're aimed away. So when we claim this June solstice as the summer solstice, that is true for anyone in the Northern Hemisphere. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere, because you live in Argentina, or you live in South Africa, or you live in Australia, we're actually in the winter solstice. And for them, when we claim it's winter time, they claim it to be summer. And when we claim it to be spring, they claim it as fall, and we claim it to be fall, they claim it as spring. They all flip if you're on the bottom half of the earth. Is it really the bottom half? The answer is no. Top and bottom are arbitrary. 
We're floating in space. There is no up. There is no down. Have you ever seen a map of the Earth where everything is flipped upside down? Where the southern hemisphere is put on top and the northern hemisphere is put down below? Dr. Google, quick, look. Look up, just an upside down map of the Earth. It's the same, it's just upside down. But if I ask you to find something, could you find it? Like, could you find us easily on there? Like, it's, you have to try a little bit more, because like, wait, I should be, no, no, I'm supposed to look over here to the west, wait, oh, crap, oh, crap, where, where, where is everything now? It reorients how we think. The word orient, do you know what orient means? We use it. We, we bathe an entire continent of people using this word. You know what the word orient actually means? It means east. When you orient yourself, that just means you know one of your directions. And once you know one direction, you know all of them. And we, or, and we deal with this term by referencing Asia. I don't know why. But we do. But if you look at that picture of the Earth, when it's flipped not the way we're used to it, suddenly East and West are backwards. And it's like, okay, a little disorienting. But why is that one not correct, but the other one that you're used to looking at correct? Reason why? Not what we chose. It's what uh, even these pictures are reflecting it. It's what these people chose. Notice how in all of these, yes, let's show you where the United States is. Even though the people who picked this orientation are kind of stuck over there on the side. I don't know. If you've never thought about like why we show things the way we do. Hmm. What's the longest day of the year? Every day is the longest day of the year. Because everywhere on Earth, you have the exact opposite on the other side. Every day is an equinox. It is 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. If we look at it on the scale of the Earth, there is no longest day, there is no shortest day. It's just, what is it to you? It becomes a relative game. So as we're flipping around, one of the things that we have to worry about, because we're on a tilt, is how light is going to hit us. If you have light directly aimed right at you, all of the energy and light, and y'all have had to take chemistry, so you know that there's like some stupid equation that tells you something about the wavelength of light, has something, or the frequency of light has something to do with like the amount of energy that shows up in the light or some jazz like that. If I were to take that light and shine it on the Earth, it turns out you get the same amount. Everywhere we get blasted, every beam of light that hits us has the same amount of energy. The catch becomes, it's not the amount, it's the density. If I were to take a flashlight and shine it directly at the Earth, I'll make a circle. But if I shine it at an angle, so if I were shining it on the top of like a basketball, or just take my flashlight and angle it, you make something, it's not going to be like an ellipse, but it's going to look ellipse-esque. In both cases, this flashlight versus this top one, the amount of light coming out of the flashlight is the exact same. The difference is if I were to measure the area between the two. The one that's aimed directly at the Earth has more energy per area than if you start moving towards the poles.
And that turns out to be kind of, sort of important. A comment about how you could have the endless day and then you can have an endless night, depending on where you are, six degrees north or south latitudes. That has to do with the fact that we're at an angle that's about 30-ish degrees. And when you're about 30-ish degrees away from the north or the south, when we're aimed just right, the sunlight is always going to be hitting within that 30-ish degrees. And the result is, for a quarter of the year, parts of the Earth never have a sunset. The sun will go right down to the horizon, go, ha, and skip right back up. But the sun is always out. I went once. I've only been really north once in my life. I went to a wedding in Calgary. So it's Canada, but it's the bottom of Canada. It's practically like saying the United States. It was 11 o'clock at night. Wedding was still going, or at least the reception was still going. And I remember walking out of in the hotel and all the windows had like blackout blinds. I was like, why is that? So I went over to one and I rolled it up. It was light outside. It was 11 p.m. at night. There was still light. It was also during the summertime, so that helped explain it. It eventually went down at like 1 in the morning. The sun disappeared. But it was a, it's real. It's real. Have any of you experienced that? It's weird. And it's disorienting when you don't, like, let, there needs to be some dark. Bring, bring on some dark, please, so I can figure out that it's nighttime and I can go to sleep. But similarly, they're going to have six months of the year where it's going to be aimed away and there will never be light. The sun will go right up to the horizon. If this is the horizon, the sun will go, ha, and then go right away. You see it showing up. And then, ha, huh, it will go away, and you will never see the sun crest. You'll never see it rise. And it has to do with these angles. Okay, but who cares? With this energy zapping the Earth, we luck out in that we happen to have a layer of gas around us. We have that layer of gas because we happen to have a molten core. That molten core contains a whole bunch of iron, and we know that molten iron, when you get it a move in, it generates a magnet. And the result of this molten core going a move in is we have a giant magnet around the Earth. Convenient, because we use it every once in a while. What that magnet can do is take the light that comes from the sun, because some of it includes a whole bunch of death particles. They'll come, zap right at us, and they get, boom, bounce right off of the magnetic field. They get deflected away. For the most part, we don't notice it unless you live at the tippy tips where it, there's not as much magnetic field and you can see those particles whacking the magnetic field that protects us. And when they get hit, they produce colors. And we call those, of course, the auroras, the northern lights or the southern lights. It's also how old-fashioned TVs work. It was the exact same thing. Not sure what just happened. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. So. That's actually still working. It's just the thing that's like saying, no. I don't know what's going on. It's freaking out on me. So as we're hitting here, what we're going to get is differential heating. Why do we care about differential heating? There's a thing that's going to happen. As we zap energy to that air, what we're going to do is heat the air. Well, what happens when you heat up the air? The response is usually, it moves. How does it move? It rises. No, that's not true. What happens is heat... You heat the air, it's going to expand. Hot things expand. Cold things 
contract. As it expands, it's going to get bigger. What happens to its density? Its density will decrease. The result is we will now have two sets of masses. We'll have a less dense body of air and a more dense body of air. And it turns out denser air shoves itself underneath less dense air. Uh, not less dense, more dense. And the result is warm air rises. So when you say warm air rises, that's not true. It's actually shoved up. Which seems a little strange to say it that way, but eh, that's what it is. So what do we notice? The area where we're going to have the most sun hitting it, we're going to get the most shift in all of this. So the result's going to be the air is going to be shoved upwards. But there's a catch that comes with this. This is the part that gets a little screwy. The Earth is spinning. There's a little rule, well, some dude by the name of Newton came up with three sets of rules. He actually didn't discover the three rules, but he's the white guy who did, so we give him the credit for it, even though Muslims figured it out a long time before him. But a lot of their stuff was burned away, so they didn't write the textbooks. The three rules. Uh, I hate physics, I hate physics. And then there's something called inertia. So there's something called inertia. What's inertia? An object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by a force, and that's why we get that second and third law. Other one is something at rest stays at rest until it's acted on by an outside force, which is a nice way of saying, don't mess with me. That's Newton's first law. Don't mess with me. If I'm holding still, I'm going to stay still. If I'm moving, I'm going to move. Well, we have this Earth. The Earth is spinning. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw something on the Earth. I'm going to throw it towards the North Pole. As I throw it towards the North Pole, the problem is it's going to be trapped here on Earth within our air and all that stuff. The Earth is spinning in this particular fashion. And what it's going to do is the air, because the, it's kind of stuck with the Earth, it's going to get deflected. Meaning it's going to start to, instead of moving up, it's going to deflect as the Earth spins. And what we actually see, instead of it going straight up, yeah, it's totally freaking out, I know, is it's going to start to deflect towards the east. And if you keep following it along, the logic will be it's going to then loop back. If I were to look at this on, for the sun, from the southern hemisphere, they exist too. If I were to toss something down, you get a mirror image reflection as to what's going on. We refer to this phenomenon as the Coriolis effect. I misspelled Coriolis. I did it, yay. The Coriolis effect is a byproduct of the fact that the Earth is spinning and Newton's first law says, don't mess with me. If the Earth is not spinning, we do not see the Coriolis effect. Or if you were to throw something away from the Earth and outside of being trapped in our space, the Coriolis effect disappears. So it's... It's a byproduct of a whole bunch of things. It's not a real force. What this does is it means that as we heat up the air, it's going to deflect. How is it going to deflect? It's going to deflect up or down. 
how far will it deflect up or down? Roughly 30 degrees. I know, it'll come back. It always comes back. Don't know when, but it will. It's our day. It's the struggle I've had in here the entire time. Like I said, it eventually comes back. It will deflect roughly 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south. Good for it. When this air, this less dense air is shot up, it eventually is going to cool. As it cools, it's going to get rid of whatever it needs to as it cools. Well, what do you get rid of when things cool? You get rid of water. So as it goes up and cools, we're going to rid it of water. And eventually it's going to then fall right back down. If with, again, this about 30 degrees jump that we'll see. We get an exact same pattern at about 60 degrees. They'll then make loops again. One of the things that we happen to notice about this is where the air seems to be dumping down, because again, the pattern that we see, the air that's dumping down doesn't have water in it. Well, what do you call a stretch of land where you don't get water from the sky? You call it desert. And what do we notice? Roughly 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Deserts which is explained by the fact that the Earth is spinning with a little bit of a tilt. We didn't have that spin and the tilt. We can't explain those two things, which shockingly, the flat Earthers never bring up because this one's really hard to explain if the Earth is flat. Seriously? That's right. That's what I thought. This comes with a fun little pattern. As the air goes up, we don't have as much air in that spot. So we would call this an area of low pressure. And areas where we see the air dumping back down, seriously, we call it high pressure. Oh yeah, that's a normal one. In here, yeah, it is. It's just cranky. It's like, I've been trying. You're making me do stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. We're off by roughly about 30 degrees. So we don't twist this way. We actually twist this way. So what we get, seriously, let's just do that. Cranky. Okay, so that's happy. This doesn't know what it's going to do. Put it back. Got one. Good enough. So we have these two areas of high pressure. We have an area of low pressure. Why point that out? Because it turns out that explains the wind. Wind moves from high to low pressure. So if I have an area where the air is moving up, and I have areas where the air is dumping back down, the result is I can have low pressure, I can have high pressure. And like I said, wind blows from high to low pressure. So if I look at this, wind is going to go from this high pressure area down towards a low pressure area. And it's going to follow that weird little convection current, or that Coriolis effect that I pointed out you before. We plot 
or people care about these patterns and we name the winds that we turn out to see, which is, you know, okay, good for us and all that fun stuff. More importantly, the ocean does the same thing. So the ocean is going to follow a similar pattern, but with it... So as you know, the, the, my computer just decided to stop recording. So this is just me talking to my, com to my iPad. So this will be a lot faster than it would be in person. So if we look at how winds go, we, we saw some patterns up over here that are predictable. It turns out we can see the exact same thing looking at the ocean where we could actually see patterns of flow here that it's caused by density so high salt content versus lower salt content changes the density and we get this driving current the largest one that we know of runs as a conveyor belt in the atlantic one of the issues that we're starting to worry about is what if due to polar melt or us melting the ice caps and the glaciers that we interfere with some of these ocean currents. Well, part of the concern is we actually might disrupt water flow within the Mediterranean, and that could actually lead to Europe having freeze spells, where massive chunks of Europe freezes, and that's not normally a thing. And it's now going to be perfectly possible, or it is a possible forecast, if climate change results in the disruption of some of these current patterns. When we start looking at land, we start getting the same patterns of how we can get movement of air. So one of those <coughs> has to do with, when we look at land and water, how we can have differential heating. So during the day land heats more which means that air is going to flow from the ocean onto land though air that's flowing from the ocean has more moisture in it because it's a source of water that's going to flow on into land and a lot of areas where you have water you're actually going to have mountains nearby and as that air moves up the mountain it's going to cool, and as it cools, it's going to condense the water, which means eventually we're going to get precipitation. So PPT, precipitation, we're going to have rain, snow, whatever. The result is we're going to have a ch portion of this mountain range where we're going to have heavy rain flow. The problem is once you get onto the other side of the mountain, there's little moisture in the, in the water or in the air, as it were. And the result is we have this thing that we call a rain shadow, which is we just don't happen to see rain there. What will it look like? It looks like a desert. You could actually see this phenomenon all over the place. So if you look at California, with the San Bernardino Mountains or the Sierra Nevada Mountains. What's on the other side? Deserts. If you look at the Cascades in Washington, what's on the other side? Desert. If you look on the big island of Hawaii, you'll see the exact same thing, where there's forest on one side, desert on the other. We also can get some predictable appearances, especially if you happen to have a view that is perfectly north-south. So a south-facing slope in the northern hemisphere is actually usually going to be a little more barren, and this is because of sun intensity. It makes it so mower things aren't going to grow, and you actually get more lushness on the north facing slope. And we actually have a portion of the James Dealey field trip 
where we're actually going to walk along a north-south slope, and you can perfectly see this. When we start considering where we find life, we need to consider what we call the abiotic factors. Abiotic means it has nothing to do with life, meaning not was, is, or will be alive. So, like, skeletons don't count as abiotic because they once belonged to something that was alive. And, you know, molecular precursors for DNA could be considered to be part of something that's alive, so we would call that biotic, not abiotic. So what are those factors? They're things like temperature or water or oxygen. This is an issue with caves. Salinity is an issue in soil, which does have some issues. Um, whether there's sunlight present or not is important to determine what type of ecosystem or pattern we find around the world. Um, or biomes, as it were. So, yeah. And here where it has rocks dealing with soil. So the catch with soil is soil has an organic layer. And this organic layer is combined with rocky layers underneath it. So when we say soil, there is a component of it that is biotic, so that part gets tricky. But based upon these things here, we can define all of these biomes. So an ecosystem, just as a refresher, is a local area of life and non-life, so where the biotic and abiotic meet. But when we look at the patterns of them, we call those biomes. So these are ecosystem patterns that we can end up defining. We can also find biomes when we look in aquatic situations. So aquatic ecosystems, we get the same argument. Again, ecosystem is a local thing. Biome is the pattern. Under aquatic systems, we care about oxygen and salinity and sunlight. And that is those are the big three. Um, oxygen has some is severely related to um, the temperature of the water. So as the temperature of water decreases, you can increase the amount of oxygen gas that it can hold. So warm waters are not good. So the fact that we are warming up the oceans is not good for things that need to suck oxygen out of the oceans. Salinity is what helps produce those density gradients that helps drive currents. We also get hypersaline pools, like what we would see here. So this is underwater. And it turns out that these saline pools are toxic because salts are corrosive. So coming in contact with these are not good for your nervous system. And then obviously sunlight because sunlight has something to do with photosynthesis. So it's kind of important to know about that. Also, it messes with the type of light that you see, so the quality of the light. The big thing that we notice when we start looking at abiotic factors is they don't actually remain constant. And the reason for that is things are, you know, temperatures are constantly fluctuating because of air currents. Tectonics are shifting, which means we're shifting wind patterns and we're going to shift around currents. And this is normal. We know that whenever you change the environment, you need to have physiology that can deal with that new adaptation. And either you have that physiological change or you can give it to your offspring or you can't. And the result of this over long periods of time is we change species. And part of what drives this is this changing of the environment. And that's because we're constantly shifting around those abiotic factors and we don't get to keep them stagnant because the earth is not stagnant. So when we start looking at biomes, which are defined by a whole list of factors, we typically see them dealing with plants. So we actually look at biotic factors. So we look at what type of vegetation there is. And by vegetation, what we mean is any plant life.
And so things that are terrestrial, it's the plants that actually are the big driver, not necessarily the water or the temperature, which is kind of a weird thing to say. When we look at things that are aquatic, it's lights and nutrients. So where's the food coming from? So here, we can't walk through all the biomes because there's just not enough time for that. So I'm just walking you through a handful of them. And this is like the degree to which I care that you know you don't need to memorize everything from the book because there's a lot there. So when we think of tropical forests, they're going to be equatorial or sub-equatorial, meaning right around the equator. They have heavy rainfall, the temperatures are pretty constant, and they're usually warm. They have high biodiversity, lots of different plants, and they can either be direct or wet or dry, depends on their location. But when it rains, it rains, but it can also dry out. Deserts are usually found 30 degrees north or south, and they are in the interiors of continents. They don't get a lot of rain, and their temperatures can vary widely. They can go from scorching hot to freezing cold. Their plants are usually pretty small, and they have some strange physiology adaptations to deal with these temperature fluctuations and the extreme heat and the lack of water. The savanna is in between these tropical forests and the deserts, so they're in between. They will have wet and dry seasons, so they're kind of in between the two. And they're more like the tropical forest in terms of their... They tend to be warmer, but they don't have as... They have more variation than you'd see in a tropical forest. Here you find trees and grasses, and this is where you'll think of things like the raising animals and the carnivores. In the chaparral, it's in the same location as where you'd find the deserts, but it's coastal. So this is... Southern California. When it rains, it rains. We have been experiencing that. But we could also have bigger fluctuations in temperature. Not as great as you see in a desert, because deserts are inland. But we still have desert fluctu or temperature fluctuation. We are known for shrubs and small trees that usually require fire for germination and regulating the diversity. Above and below us would be temperate grasslands, 36 degrees north and south in the interior. So these are going to be above or below where we'd expect to find the deserts. They have super seasonal rain with temperature fluctuations, and they're predominated with grasses. Then you have the tundra, which is found exclusively in the northern hemisphere. There is none in the southern hemisphere, and it's 60 degrees north latitude and higher. It's generally cold and they have variable precipitation in terms of how much rain or if it's snow or sleet. They don't tend to get big plants, so they're more mosses and grasses. Aquatic biomes are also very diverse and we can't go through them all, so here's just a smattering of them. We're gonna actually visit some wetlands and this is where the water is all, or the ground is always saturated with water. There's lots of photosynthesis here. They can dry out. They do have high biodiversity, but they make lots of food. They're also a good way to filter out the water because the water is always in soil and soil is a pretty good filter for pollution. So it's good to protect your wetlands. Estuaries are where the river and the sea mix. So we get a mixing of salt and fresh water. This produces an edge effect which is where we can get the mixing of biomes, meaning a river environment with a saltwater environment, so we can have organisms from both. A lot of the photosynthesis comes from grasses and algaes here, and the salinity fluctuates because it depends on high tides versus low tides. They tend to be quite diverse, and you have some fascinating physiology that has to go on there. If we move out into larger bodies of water, we have an area that we call the intertidal zone, which is between high tides and low tides, and they can fluctuate a whole bunch. They usually use algae for photosynthesis because they're better at clinging to those rocks. They have variable oxygen environments, and so organisms there have to be able to adapt to being out in the sun or underwater. Pelagic zones are a nice way of saying open water, they have lots of photosynthesis because they have lots of phytoplankton and there's a lot of open water on Earth. So it produces a whole bunch of 
nutrition. The problem is if if you start looking at it by area, it's not a lot, but because there's so much space, there's a lot that's produced. It is the largest biome on Earth, and it's quite diverse because of it, but only if you look at the top in what we call the photic zone, as opposed to going down to the benthic zone, which is the bottom. Typically, we associate the benthic with the dark, or what we could also call the abyssal zone. There, we have strange metabolic strategies, and you can have temperatures fluctuating from near freezing to if you're near a geothermal vent underwater, it could be practically boiling hot. And they tend to be organic rich because everything that dies in the ocean sinks to the bottom. So we actually have huge areas of diversity that we have no clue what it is. But whenever we go looking, it always shocks us. So the problem with all of that is climate change interferes with it because climate change is messing with our abiotic factors. Quite simply, more CO2 you have, you can decrease pH rather quickly, and this can interfere with anything that relies on calcium carbonate, which turns out to be lots of shells and structures in the ocean. So that's not good. We're also changing temperatures, which again deals with oxygen levels, which is gonna be an issue. We're also having issues with precipitation and we're changing weather patterns. If you recall, there was a big storm that kind of came on down. It was a polar vortex that froze a good chunk of the United States. That's not normal. What typically happens is our air traps the cold the cold air of the arctic up top and our warm air traps it but as we're making these patterns more unstable we get these shoves of cold air down and we get freeze spells which is again not a normal thing this is something that people can argue well this happens naturally and yeah, okay. Slow change is something that we're perfectly okay with dealing with. The problem is rapid evol- change usually involves extinction events. And not a lot of organisms can rapidly adapt to this. There is one group that seems to be thriving with this, and those are the sea jellies, which are the canaries in the coal mine for climate change. I walked through this paper in class um, about some of our worries. Photosynthesis is temperature sensitive, and there seems to be a calculated theoretical maximum of roughly 47 degrees Celsius, at which point um, the mechanisms of photosynthesis fail. And um, we're not at the 47, but we're getting pretty close. And if you were to look up this this paper, there's the source. If you look at figure 3A, we're starting to dance around with temperatures in tropical forests approaching the point where photosynthesis stops. So the next lecture for the week, we're going to be looking at communities and biotic factors.